Today, you can access the entire collection of information used to create university level health and safety programs for free. Today, you could sign up for an MBA and in a year from now, have an MBA for free. If you haven't done either of those things, and you probably haven't, there's a reason. For the people who have taken that first step, almost all of them drop out and walk away. This is a story about the rationality of never starting or of giving up and how we can create the conditions for you and for those around us to actually get better. Hey, it's Andrew, and this is Safety on Tap. Since you're listening in, you must be a leader wanting to grow yourself and drastically improve health and safety along the way. Welcome to you. You're in the right place. If this is your first time joining in, thanks for joining us, and well done for trying something different to improve. And of course, welcome back to all of you wonderful regular listeners. I worked in an organisation in which it was normal for people to talk about responsibility by saying things like, okay, Jill, you're on the hook for that action. And when we were discussing like big stuff, big projects or high workload or something that might have been a little bit risky for you to have your name attached to, people might kindly ask something like, do you really want to be on the hook for that? At the time, I thought it was a kind of strange phrase. It conjured up images of catching slippery sea creatures and dragging them to their demise. Or in darker moments, you know, the more dread-filled meat hook so favoured by horror writers and medieval dungeon keepers. It just didn't make sense as a metaphor. It turns out that the idiom on the hook actually does come from fishing. And a fish which is on the hook has been caught. It has no other options. So what happens next is clear. On the flip side, a fish which is not yet on the hook is free. It can go anywhere, do anything. And one which was on the hook, but is no longer on the hook, has slipped off the hook. This metaphor gives us a long runway into a discussion about responsibility and accountability more broadly, which I will explore in an episode soon. But for now, we need to talk about putting ourselves on the hook, you and I, taking responsibility for the things that we control. The OHS Body of Knowledge is a project which began in Australia and has since had collaborators involved from all over the world with one goal in mind, to attempt to define and to update the core stuff that people like you and I should know and do. A body of knowledge is a necessary component um, for our claim to be professionals, which is kind of tricky because we don't all agree on what we should know and do. But that aside, there is heaps of stuff that I think most of us would agree that we do need to know and do, like legal compliance is relevant and preventing and minimising harm and specific kinds of control measures that are effective for specific kinds of hazards. It's a bunch of expert authors who get together and write a chapter, different experts for different chapters depending on their expertise, and they draw on the most contemporary evidence and literature for health and safety theory and practice. The OHS Body of Knowledge, its main purpose is for universities as a kind of master reference from which they build their degree programs for health and safety, either their undergraduate or their uh, master's level programs. And it has been freely available in full, downloadable from ohsbok.org.au since around 2012, I think. And who knows about it? Who accesses it? The answer is almost no one. All the ways that we could take this freely accessible and comprehensive OHS body of knowledge and use it as health and safety professionals. Imagine managers could use it as part of a kind of a manual for the way that their teams do safety, the safety 101 in the organization. Professionals could use it for their professional development, like, I don't know, reading a chapter every month um, or having a look at the references to deepen their understanding on a topic. Teams could use it. And each member of the team could take a chapter and become kind of the uh, local expert in that by reading all about that and then teaching it to other members of the team. Industry collaboration groups could use it as a reference to kind of guide their agenda uh, so that it's less affected by individual interests and politics. There could be 
uh, an OHS Body of Knowledge book club where random collections of people get together and they read the chapters and then they discuss them. Students could use it to expand on their course curriculum, especially if you're doing a degree that's not safety, but something like, say, engineering or nursing or design or something like that, freely accessible. Employers could use it for an internship program. People looking to get into health and safety could use it to self-educate themselves, especially if they're unable to access or afford university education, no matter where they are in the world. But almost all of these things are ideas. They're, they're, they're dreams. They're fragments of enormous potential left in the bottom drawer of life. Because there is no hook. Gym memberships work when they have a few key ingredients. One is that the sunk cost motivates us to use what we have already paid for or are continuing to pay for. But that's not all. Long-term use of gym memberships also depends, and this is from the research, it also depends on the enjoyment of the experience Self-efficacy, which is the creation of a feeling that I can do this, I can achieve my goals, I can engage in the process, and social support from friends and family. So that means you've got people around you who think that it's a reasonable or good idea to do it, they are supportive of that, and they may even role model that themselves. A lot of people ask me whether they should do an MBA, and I'm not sure why, since I, I don't have one. And I would rarely suggest that someone does one. But they might ask because I work with lots of health and safety leaders who are motivated and kind of continual learners. I don't know. I used to ask people when they asked me this question, why they wanted an MBA. And many of the responses came back with some variation of, I don't know, it just kind of seems like the next step or a good idea. That's not a recipe for success. So then I ask them about what's important to them. What really matters? What will float their boat or what might improve their employability or increase their status at work? These are the things that make for bigger and pointier hooks for us to be on and reduces our chances of wiggling off the hook. You can get an MBA for free. There is a link that I have put into the show notes for this episode with a list of 15 online MBA programs you can do for free. Have a look over at safetyontap.com forward slash EP207. That's where the list is of free MBA programs. Now, so these free online courses are often called MOOCs or Massive Open Online Courses or Massive Online Open Courses. Either way, MOOC. It's kind of free and accessible education for anyone who has uh, a reasonably smart device and an internet connection. And in 2022, the average completion rate for MOOCs was reported as between 7% and 15%. It's rarely more than 25%. And in one study, more than 50% of the people who signed up never got more than halfway through the program. So imagine if you're an educator or a trainer and you could not get 93% of people all the way through to graduation, to the end point of the training or the program. How would you feel? Now, that sounds like a dismal failure to me, but it's it's not that simple. The problem here is not with the content or the quality or the educators. I think it's got to do with there being no real hook for people to be on. What is happening here? One of the ways that we can get on the hook is with money. What is a value is worth paying for. Now, if you invest now for a payback, you'll get later. There's this story that we tell ourselves, though not many of us are are kind of really aware of it, about the value of things, including the monetary value. So paying matters. The OHS body of knowledge is free. You have at least 15 MBA programs you can do for free, but you don't and you won't. But it's not just about money either. I think there's a broader, more complex psychological kind of investment that's going on here, which separates out people doing the stuff and getting what they want from people who don't and they get nothing. Hey, it's Andrew with a quick reflection about performance. No one wakes up in the morning thinking, I wish I had a coach for work. So it's pretty normal that coaching isn't a concept that's on your mind. What I do know is from working with hundreds of health and safety professionals, 
What's more likely to be in your mind are the frustrations you might be feeling about making change or the doubts you have about your ability to step up or concerns you have about the capability of your team to better service the needs of your organization. Or maybe you're excited but unsure about your new promotion, that expanded responsibility, or how in the heck you'll develop and deliver that new health and safety strategy. These are the everyday things in the game of health and safety practice. Some good, some not so good. A coach is not on the field of play with you. They don't pass you the ball and tell you what to do. A coach helps you be ready for the game, to prepare a plan, to develop the skills and the capabilities for the next challenge, and support you through the losses as well as the wins. Coaching is not evaluated on your participation or the time spent. Coaching is only evaluated on its outcomes, outcomes for you, and they can be pretty awesome. Coaching is one of the most effective forms of professional development I've ever seen. I have a long list of stories and people who I can put you in touch with to tell you exactly how they've benefited from coaching with me. And it's a pretty smart investment in valuable resources for you and your team. If you want to explore how coaching might help accelerate you and your team's success, visit www.safetyontap.com forward slash curious. One of the ways that we can see or look at an investment, which isn't just money, is in the difference between the process and the outcome, which create two very different hooks. The investments in each create two very different hooks. We're happy to be on the hook for safety management systems, but we're not so happy to be on the hook for actual safety outcomes. We're happy to be on the hook to deliver training, but we're not so happy to be on the hook for the actual learning, which is the outcome of the training. The process and the outcomes are very different hooks. I have spent a number of years enabling learning in lots of different ways inside organizations, including the very popular but fraught learning teams. If you want to know why I say that, you can send me a DM later. The way that I uh, do this with learning teams as an example, because lots of people are familiar with them, is by building capability inside health and safety teams to plan and facilitate and follow up and to embed these through the full life cycle of the learning process in the context of the work of the safety team and the operations. I don't just teach them stuff. There's a lot of structure and um, importantly, I put them on the hook. So the way that I put them on the hook is this. I say to whoever called me on the phone asking for my help, the person who's usually paying the bill, I say, look, you can invest in training or you can do other things and you may or may not get the outcome that you want, but you can show your boss a certificate, for example, or you can invest in the actual outcomes, which is real learning teams enabled by your people, not an external, which deliver actual operational improvements. And I say to them, not only am I confident about my ability to be able to help you, and I work out whether I'm confident in their ability to be able to do that, I say to them that if you don't get the outcomes, then you don't have to pay me. I'll put my fee at risk as long as you and your team are prepared to be on the hook, to show up, to go through the process, to do this, and you'll get the results that you're looking for. Does that sound okay? And guess what happens after that conversation? It's really interesting. The first one is that no one has ever asked me for a refund because we together, team by team, organization by organization, have created the conditions for everyone to be on the hook for the outcome, including me. The second interesting thing, which kind of surprised me, is that some people will, after that conversation, decide that they'll take the safe path to do a training course or just read the book or get the team to listen to a few podcasts and then try it themselves. And there's nothing fundamentally wrong with that. It's just that they are more comfortable by being on the hook for a process that they go through, which is fine, but they're not prepared to be on the hook for the outcome. Because when you genuinely give people the opportunity to be on the hook for the outcome, that's really scary. Why is it scary to be on the hook? Why would we not all be full bottle professionals accessing all this free learning? Why would we not want to be accountable for actual outcomes. There's plenty of reasons. I'm busy. We're not sure. It might not work. It sounds like hard work. I might fail or even scarier, I might succeed. 
and set a new bar for myself and for others. If you are a fish that gets hooked, there is only one outcome left for you. But I think the idiom, the, the, the imagery there, unfairly makes being on the hook a negative thing. I think what it really means is that we are in a situation in which it's really clear the things that we value and that we're chasing down. And we are unapologetic about ignoring all of the other billion other things that we could value or chase down. Choosing to be on the hook for something is scary because we decide to reject our ability to flop around and slip off the hook and to chase other things with all of the justification in the world, but ignoring what we're on the hook for in the first place. Whether we're talking about our own development or making change in our organizations, there are plenty of good reasons why we're not set up for what we really want. You can call it context or structure or conditions or whatever, that there are things that we can control that change our chances of the right people being on the hook for the change that we seek to make. If you or I or them are not on the hook, we need to ask why does it make sense to avoid the hook or to be slippery and get off the hook? And what can we do to increase our chances of hopping onto the right hook gladly and staying there? Thanks so much for listening. Until next time, what's the one thing you'll do to take positive, effective or rewarding action to grow yourself and drastically improve health and safety along the way? See ya.